Order. Roll call, please. Councilmember Cole. Here. Councilmember Schwer. Here. Recording stopped. Oh. Councilmember Wong is absent. Councilmember Nordby. Here. Mayor Mongi. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Can I get a motion to adopt the agenda? So move, Your Honor. So move, Councilmember Schwer. Second. Second. <laughs> you pick. <Mayor> <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Well, thank you. All right. We got our recording top. in pro recording recording in progress. Thank you, Mayor. We got uh, three topics tonight. First one up is our canine presentation. We have Ramsey County here, and I think we'll have uh, Chief Babinroth to start us off. Thank you, Chief. Good. Hi, hi everyone. Mr. Mayor, City Council, happy to be here today. This presentation is kind of the culmination of uh, two years of of research and, and conversations and, and training. A lot of it uh, credit is due to Sergeant Ben Badowich. Uh, he he kind of spearheaded our, our venture into exploring everything canine program related. So happy to finally deliver some information on the on the topic. And and very honored to have our uh, some good good folks here with us, Ramsey County Sheriff's Deputy Tony Body, uh, Rick Rodine and Steve Pearson from Performance Kennels, and then Canine Zeus in the background, you might hear occasionally. So to start it off, um, just a little about canines in Ramsey County. There's a total of five agencies currently that have police canines. So Rose, Roseville, Moundsview, Ramsey County, Maplewood, and St. Paul. We're currently dependent on one of these agencies having a canine on, on shift when the situation ever arises where we would need them to help us out on an incident. Some of those recent incidents have been searching for homicide suspects, firearms, shooting suspects, missing kids, vulnerable adults, building searches, drugs, and search warrant executions. So what does a canine program bring to an agency? Um, definite enhancement of, of the delivery of public safety. Starting off with the bread and butter, just search and rescue uh, operations. Also searching for evidence, firearms, weapons. Dogs can get into places that people physically cannot get into, um, including spaces or, or places where it would be more dangerous to send a police officer. Uh, they can search and locate missing children, vulnerable and, and high risk people. They can smell narcotics. Uh, they enhance officer safety. They're great for community engagement and then de-escalating and diffusing countless situations. A couple recent incidents uh, on September 19th, 2021, North St. Paul police officers responded to Housie Park for a shooting. Suspect was uh, identified by the resident attempting to steal items from their vehicle. The resident then confronted the suspect Suspect runs away. As they're running, they fired 19 shots at the suspect, uh, hitting their resident, uh, hitting their house and their vehicle, thankfully not the person, um, because we didn't have a canine of our own. We put in the request. And, you know, as when, when you put in a request for another agency to come help you out, you're dependent on one, that agency having a canine on, um, and then that agency not already being tied up on an own, their own incident in their city. So in this particular case, it was 26 minutes later, we were able, able to get some assistance. And at that time, the, the suspect was uh, gone. We are very thankful. This isn't a slam on our, our assisting agencies. We're, we're very thankful anytime we're getting assistance, but just that's the reality of police work. There's things going on in, in every single city at the same time. So we can put out the ask, but if they're doing their own thing, trying to keep their own city safe, it might be a little bit before we can get that assistance. A couple other uh, requests. We had two recent searches of North High School for firearms uh, in this most recent school year. In those cases, the canine from the ATF helped us out. Uh, burglaries at our own VFW and Legion. A couple other residential and, and business burglaries. Then our homicide on McKnight on June 19th, where we're looking for multiple suspects. We had canines from multiple agencies. And in that case, the Moundsview canine team 
actually located a set of keys that one of the suspects was carrying on them as they were fleeing the scene. Um, and then there's countless just various incidents where if we would have had a canine, that would have been able to help us out in the immediate. So just last year alone, looking at these totals, there's 27 burglaries, 461 suspicious activities, community events, we had 34 weapons calls, 10, two homicides, 19 missing persons, domestic assaults, 143. So really the uh, amount of incidents where we, if we would have had a canine, they would have benefited the incident. Um, they're, the number's pretty high. It also enhances our department, just to operationally helps with retention, recruitment. Uh, police officers like having opportunities, and when there's more opportunities, that absolutely increases morale. Um, so having a canine program on, on our agency would be a huge benefit. Then on the officer development and growth, there's a, the minimum for canine handler training is 16 hours a month. So every, every month, the officers that are canine handlers, they're getting 16 hours of, of training. Um, it also allows us to be a, a resource for other agencies. So if you know our partners in, in Maplewood or, or Ramsey County, happen to be on shift with, without a canine, their canine officers off, you know, we would then be able to help them and return the favors that they uh, often give us with canine assistance. And then our you know, ultimate goal is strengthening trust within our community, so doing all the community engagement events that we can. When we get requests from schools to come do a demo at uh, various schools or community events, we're able to deliver on that um, and make connections and strengthen trust with our community. So operationally, the goal would be to have one canine on the day shift and one on the night shift. This would allow public safety to be enhanced for residents uh, and, and safety of our officers by having police canines at all hours of the day. Um, this also, if you have two, it, it allows handlers to train together, which would then reduce overtime costs because they wouldn't be dependent on training with another agency on their, their training schedule. So when they can train uh, on shift, then that cuts on, on the overtime costs and it also just increases our availability um, that a dog's gonna be on our, our scheduled shift. So funding, the 2023 public safety aid bill, this was one-time public safety funds for local, county, and tribal governments. Uh, North St. Paul is expected to receive about $542,000 in this bill. Other cities are spending on their public safety areas some of the funds on hiring and retention bonuses, body-worn cameras, recruiting, and, and vehicles and equipment. Um, my uh, intention would be to spend uh, some of this, these funds on our canine program for us. So what do these costs actually look like? The police dog itself is 12000 vet care, 1,500 food, 1,300, the basic canine equipment package, 1,400, handler school, 6,500, the squad car is, is obviously the big ticket item, uh, and 90,000 for the fully uh, suited squad car. A kennel at a, the handler's residence, 2,000, and then annual association fees, uh, 500. So for a two canine program, the initial cost is, is the big price tag, um, but using those state public safety aid grant funds, um, the total would be $230,400 just for the initial. And recently, which you'll hear about more uh, when we start talking CIP stuff, but push some squad cars to uh, further retention replacement cycles. So that uh, made some room for the incoming, what would be incoming two new uh, K-9 squad cars. So on an annual basis for a two K-9 program, uh, vet care, $3,000, food, $2,600, association fees, 1,000, boarding costs, 2,000. The Fair Labor Standards Act uh, mandates that police K-9 teams, uh, police K-9s belong to the department and then we must compensate the K-9 handler for at-home care, grooming and training of the dog. That's really the, the biggest cost associated with the canine program. If you don't pay them, there's been lawsuits that uh, then you end up back paying them. So it's better too when you're starting a program, you just get it all set, you get it in, in union contracts. Um, 
that ends up being for, for two handlers, 25,000 a year. So the total, 33,600 uh, for two canine program. With the upcoming addition for a contract you're, you're soon to see, uh, has an additional $32,168 in the SRO contract with 622, um, pretty much wipes out what would be the new annual cost of a canine program. So here to talk more about actual training and experiences, uh, starting off Deputy Tony Body, who's a canine handler. I've known Tony a long time. Uh, great person, great, great police officer. Very happy that he's here. Tony, I can roll right into your slides here. Okay, uh, so this is just a little bit of my background. Um, I'm assigned to carjacking and auto theft and our apprehension unit, uh, which is regional services. Uh, been with the county for eight years. My first four was a school resource officer and patrol. I've uh, been canine the last three years. Uh, five and a half of that has been SWAT uh, as an operator and now as a SWAT canine handler. Uh, Medal of Valor in 2021 and unit citations for SWAT and patrol in 21 and 22. Um, Next slide. There's my buddy. Uh, that is Canine Cross. He's a German Shepherd and Malinois mix. Four years old, service time of three years. Um, we have been involved in a lot of uh, canine work. Um, so a lot of those cities, all of those cities, and those agencies are places that we've gone for canine tracks, article searches, missing persons, um, any kind of canine services, that's about 80% of the agencies in the metro area um, that I've gone to help with Cross. Uh, next slide. So life at home, because I was a super squared away excited handler before I met Steve, I went home and when I found out I was getting my dog and I had a lot of free time because I had a kid, that's what I built. <laughs> uh, probably overkill. Um, but my dog is very cushioned and bougie and comfortable when he's at <laughs> home. I think when he's comfortable, he's more likely to work when he's happy. Um, he likes his kennel. I like his kennel. Um, very sociable to family and friends. Um, I had two other lap dogs at the time. Um, he wanted to be friends with the 15-year-old lap dogs. They did not want to be friends with him. Um, he is very stable around my kids. I have two boys at home, uh, three years old and eight months old. Um, no aggression with them whatsoever. I have not had any issues at all. Um, he takes better direction from my wife at home than he does me um, and realizes what his role is in the pack. He is very good at being able to tell the difference between when we're off and when we're on duty, right? He sees a uniform, squad car starts up in the garage, he starts barking and, and losing it. Um, at that point, I do keep kids and wife away from him because I don't do anything to confuse him. He thinks that we're going to work, and we are. So I keep that very separate. When we come back home, we pull in the garage. He knows that we're home. We're done. Uniform comes off. Kennel door opens. It's time for him to play and be a pet dog. All right. Uh, next slide. So before I got my dog, this is what my garage looked like. I added on another 500 square feet. You don't need to do that. <laughs> I have a very loving wife that believed in what my dreams were and what my career aspirations were. Um, so I used that extra 500 square feet to train when I was on paternity leave. I was off for 12 weeks. Dog can't sit for 12 weeks. He has to do something. Um, so I used that space in my garage to train. Um, winter months. Um, you know, training, we do training bi-weekly. Um, training does not happen only bi-weekly. There is training every single day with this dog, between dog and handler. I just train with my entire unit bi-weekly. But every day, we're doing something with this dog. All right. Uh, next slide. So these dogs are not savage, wild animals that go out and bite people just for no reason. All right. My dog will apprehend people when I tell him to. All right. When he's at home, these people don't look afraid of him, right? He's a pet at home. He's part of our family when he's at home. Next slide. 
Um, this is what our training looks like, and Steve will go a little bit more into training when, when we get to him. Um, a lot of these concepts I learned from Steve. Um, compulsion, we're not hitting the dogs. We're not beating up the dogs. We're not doing any of that stuff. If you're in the psychology, a lot of it is Pavlonian. Um, it's a reward system. It's conditioning, operant. It's a lot of the, psych the psychological stuff that goes along with this canine training to get the dog to do what you want him to do. If he feels like he would be rewarded for what he's doing, he's more likely to do it without conflict. All right. Um, we train with other handlers and other units. Um, send handlers to vendor training and or conferences is really important. I typically try to go to a training at least once a year um, involving other handlers. What have you seen? What's trending in your part of the country? Florida, Arizona, what are you guys allowed to do? What do your policies look like? What does your county attorney think of your canine program? How do you guys document your training? How do you guys document your apprehensions? I could go on and on for days. Those are things that you want to send your handler to to have that knowledge because it's going to be important when he's faced with a decision on should he send this dog, should he not send this dog, and then later on on Monday morning when you guys come back, now you got a lawsuit for something that your handler did. Right? Certification is uh, for the county is NPCA. Um, Steve will likely talk more about that. Um, demos helps your transparency with your agency. People love dogs. If I crash my car into a wall, there will be more Facebook notes to the sheriff about how the dog is doing and no one will care about how I'm doing, right? People love dogs. Um, it's a great opportunity to reconnect with the community. Um, I love catching bad guys with my dogs, but I love demos. It's a great opportunity for kids to come out, uh, for people to look at the cars, People want to know what the dog eats. Does he live with you? I love answering those questions, and they never get old to me. Right? And lastly, the vet. Um, you want to choose a vet that's going to be available for you 24 hours a day. Um, that dog is going to get hurt. That dog is going to eat something. My dog is eating my lunchbox on a Sunday. He needs to go to the vet right now because it can turn into something really catastrophic. And as a city, you've made an investment into this dog you do not want to lose that investment to a lunchbox, right? Uh, next slide. Uh, deployments, so for the county, we deploy for uh, narcotics, whisper and wall stops, which is basically uh, when DEA calls and says, hey, this guy's got 30 pounds of dope in his car. All we want you to do is stop it and figure out a way to get into it and run your dog around it. Awesome. That's easy because in the paper it's going to say Tony Body and Cross stopped a car with 30 pounds of dope in it when really I knew that there was dope in it already. I just have to create a traffic stop for the DEA to get into that car. Um, assisting other agency is what AOA stands for. Um, SWAT, specialty units, and feds. So typically your day shift dog is probably going to be helping a lot of your alphabet agencies. Not a ton of burglaries during the day. Whereas your night shift dog is going to be dealing with a lot of the burglaries, all the alphabet guys are gone home, they're sleeping in bed. So you're not going to be helping them much during the night. Um, search and rescue, missing kids. Um, great grandma has left the recovery unit or the memory unit at 90 years old and it's five below. We need to find her right now. We need to locate her. Um, the dog can smell her. We got a better opportunity to find her faster with the dog than without the dog. Obviously, criminal tracking and trailing, what, what, um, what Chief Babenroth sp spoke about, um, 26 minutes, you want to get a dog out there as soon as you can. More importantly, you want to get a uh, perimeter set up. Um, criminal apprehension is, is what most people would call a bite. I don't like the word bite because it just sounds like a lot, a lot of liability. Um, the correct term is apprehension. We're sending the dog to apprehend someone, right? And lastly, article search, uh, weapons, keys, clothing, evidence. Um, after the fact, we'll deploy the dog for to locate. Something that's in tall grass, we wouldn't be able to see without the dog. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> All right, so I'll actually add another caveat onto this in terms of notable deployments. Um, your last homicide in your city, my dog was involved in two of those arrests. And it's just as simple as telling the guy, stop running or I'm going to deploy the canine. The guy decides he doesn't want to be bit um, and he decides to give up. 
Right. Um, most notable, Maplewood had a suicide um, <clears throat> last summer. Uh, his wife then took their children later in the day, and she drowned her. She drowned, and she also drowned her three kids. Uh, Cross found Phoenix in Lake Vadness. He found shoes. He found a lot of different articles and put us in about 25 yards of finding the first body. Um, Steve will tell you that when I went through his school, I had a lot of difficulty getting my dog to get in the water. That was the first time he got in water, which sadly I knew that there's bodies here. He is not a cadaver dog, but their body odor was still so fresh um, that he was able to track to them. All right. Um, next slide. I think that's the final one for me. All right. Yeah, I think that's it. I want to introduce again Steve Pearson from Performance Kennels. Uh, meeting Steve for an hour prior to uh, this, this meeting. He is absolutely an expert in the uh, area of canines. And Steve was in law enforcement for over 30 years, and I think he's been training canines for almost just as long, if not longer. So very happy to have him here to speak on just the selection process and training for canines. Thanks, Steve. All right, thank you. I'm just gonna go over real briefly, I know you guys are short on time, of, of what the basic training package looks like. It's a 12-week program. It is post-approved for the entire 12 weeks, and we cover narcotics detection or explosives if we went that way, and the patrol works. What, what is patrol work? Patrol work is your tracking, your evidence search would include guns, shell casings, Anything that a suspect may drop or throw or toss that would connect him to a crime that may have occurred. Um, evidence search is, a, is not a sexy thing, but it is done a lot, and it is a super valuable uh, asset that these dogs have. A lot of people think about patrol dogs as just bite, bite, bite. That is just not the case. Uh, I retired from Brooklyn Park PD. We, we ran three dogs up there, and we used our dogs a lot. And we had very, very few bites. So you don't want to go down that road and, and, and think that that's what this is about. It's not. The, the biting part is, is a deterrent. Many, many people who, who decide to commit crimes, they don't mind fighting your officers. They, some of them enjoy it. They don't want to deal with a dog. And so just the mere threat of the, of the apprehension actually deters use of force because it deters the suspect from fleeing and they give up. Every time, no. Okay, so tracking, evidence search, criminal apprehension, building search, um, and narcotics detection. That's your basic package that you get done in 12 weeks. We get them out of that 12 weeks, get a basic certification in them, and then they're ready to work on the, on the road. That certification protects them in a sense. There is no state or federal law on, on certification of police dogs. Some states have rules and laws. Minnesota does not. So we self-police ourselves because if we don't, somebody's going to police us. And so we constantly strive for that certification. Once they're done with the 12 weeks, they're able to work the street, and, the, and then the, the training just begins. The training is ongoing, like Tony said. It's, it's just constant. Um, but finally, where do the dogs come from? They come from Eastern Europe. I get my dogs out of Slovakia. Uh, I could talk for hours about why. But here's the reason why. That's where the Eastern, the Eastern European area is where the working lines of the German Shepherd ended up. When the Soviet Union collapsed, the working dogs were still there. The West had the show dogs, the East had the working lines, and that's still true today. So you go to the factory, that's where they started, and, and that's why we go there. Um, I can, like I say, talk about that for hours. but. What I'd really like to do is answer questions rather than waste time having me talk about what I think you want to hear. I was going to ask quick, what is the service life of a dog? The patrol dog will work until roughly the, between the ages of 7 and 10. A single purpose dog that, for example, that only does narcotics or explosives, they tend to work a little bit longer because they have less, stre less stress in their life. Um, but between seven and 10. 
How old are they when we get them? 11 to 14 months. So they're young when we get them. They're, they're just kids. This dog behind uh, Rick's dog, I think he was about 12 months when, when Rick got him this past spring, and he just finished his basic training this spring. So they're young. You get a lot more bang for the buck now, um, but the training had to change because of the youth of the dog. They're still growing. Any more questions? It, m and I could be completely wrong here. My understanding is um, the dogs that are deployed right now that have been trained um, to detect marijuana need to be cycled out. Is that creating a backlog? No, it's really not because we stopped for, for the most part, we stopped training marijuana dogs three to four years ago. And so they're starting to fall off. The marijuana dogs that we have today and still do train are in the prisons, in the jails, and at the airport. Uh, they're the only current up-to-date uh, marijuana dogs. We call them weed dogs. Um, so it's really not a problem. There's only a handful of marijuana dogs left that are working in patrol. And uh, all of the dogs that I've been doing the last three and a half, four years have not been on marijuana. They are on fentanyl, however. Fentanyl, fentanyl is everywhere. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And so they do detect fentanyl pills. Talk to me a little bit about two dogs versus one. Just, this is new to me, so completely curious. I mean, go ahead. Well, specifically, um, is this for me or the chief? Whoever, which, whichever wants to handle it. Go ahead and then I'll, <laughs> sure. I'll chime in. So, kind of like I <clears throat> hinted on, if you have, kind of like we have two drones just to start it off. We have two drones in case one goes down. So if you have one canine, the canine gets injured, um, then you're out of canine for as long as that injury. And you, if you have two, you can keep your canine program rolling and keep delivering uh, the services that a canine brings to your community while the one is down. Um, the other element is is the training factor, as it's been mentioned. You know, the minimum training every single month is 16 hours. If you have two, they can train together. Versus, if you have one, then they have to hit up uh, Tony or someone, a canine handler with Maplewood or another agency, uh, say, "Hey, when when are you training? Uh, I, I need to I need your help to train my dog." probably is going to be on a day that you're not working here, which would mean it's an overtime day on our overtime salary. So the influx of, all right, well, now i got 16 hours of overtime uh, just so they can get their monthly training. Um, does that rise to the level of, well, if we would have just had two, then uh, it would have reduced overtime and, or, or cost just the same for having one because now we're paying for it in overtime by, by having one. So... Um, yeah, mostly just the, the training and then the ability in, in case there is a, an injury or uh, to the handler or the, or the canine, um, you can keep the service alive and well in your community. I don't know if you guys have anything else to add. Yeah, I do. Um, <clears throat> I, I also think, uh, so one, I'll talk about retention. Um, I think when you got two dogs or two available vacant canine handler positions, it increases interest and retention. Um, you got more competition. Officers want to stay here. They feel like they have a chance to um, evolve their career um, in North St. Paul. Secondly, from an operations standpoint, um, having a daytime canine and having a nighttime canine, again, as I talked about, is two different kinds of businesses. Uh, business. Um, North St. Paul by population is a smaller city, but you guys got a lot of business here. You got busy highways, 36, 694. There's a lot of people passing in and out of your city. Um, so while the problem people may not be your residents or might be a smaller population of your residents, it's more likely the people that work here or are passing through here that you want to use the canine for. Um, at night, there's a lot of things that happen that probably just aren't important enough to cross your desk because they ended well. Meaning, um, 
I think Steve spoke earlier where you have a bad guy that wants to fight with officers. If you don't have a canine there and officers have to go hands on with this guy, um, I can tell you I'm a big dude if I was a criminal, probably take me into custody, but I'm going to hurt a couple of your officers. I'm going to break a finger. I'm going to bust a lip. I'm going to do something versus if you got that canine and that canine barks, there's been times where I haven't even gotten out of my car and bad guy says, okay, I'm done. He gets out of the car and we're, he's taken into custody. And you never see that across your desk because it ended well. You would never know that. that that's a, what I would call a hidden statistic. You wouldn't otherwise see that because it ended well. But in that moment, you defeated injuries to officers. You defeated a use of force issue by simply having a canine there. I can just add to that quickly. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, just to kind of dial in the, the retention and, and morale boosting uh, element for, for having to, uh, just in casual conversations uh, within the department over the past two years of talking, I was talking about getting a canine program. We have a lot of young, great officers, and I, I think there's at least six that would be absolutely interested in putting in to be canine handlers. So having two, um, to get two in, into being canine handlers out of six is a lot better than just having one. So to provide that opportunity, the additional opportunity of having two become handlers would be huge. So, and to kind of build on the question of the two dogs, um, and t Tony, this can either follow you or Steve, are you the only handler? I mean, you'd mentioned when you're on paternity leave that, that your dog was home with you for the, for the 12 weeks. So the dog works your shifts, or when you're off, is it on duty with another handler? One dog, one handler. One dog, one handler. Okay. Yes. Some departments have tried that multiple handler idea because it sounds economical. That's why I asked. It doesn't work. That, that dog has to bond to the handler. Okay. I mean, when we start these dogs, uh, day one, the handlers hand feed the dogs for months. You get that bond going, and food's a powerful motivator. It's the primary reward. That's how they get dolphins to jump through the hoop, right? Food. <laughs> And you establish that bond by hand feeding these rough, tough police dogs, and you get that bond going, and everything else starts to fall in place. Thank you. What happens if an officer leaves in that dog? So the dog is the city dog. If that officer go, moves on to some other department, how do we handle that? That can, that can happen. Uh, pretty rare, but it can happen. Um, the dog is retrainable, depending on his age. If the dog is young enough, you simply train the dog to a new handler. And it's very, very doable. Dogs don't only have one bond in them. They, they can bond to a new person. And, and I've, I've done it. If the dog is eight years old and the handler moves on, it's not economically worthwhile to retrain that dog to a new handler unless that handler has experience and doesn't have to go to a 12-week program. How many um, canine does you brought up Mound Zoo? How many do they have? Two. 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 Steve, how many dogs have you received that are untrainable? Oh, most of them, mm -hmm. but in the world. But the dogs that I get, I wouldn't bring them back here if they weren't trainable. Mm -hmm. uh, if I get a here's here's the only problem that happens with these dogs. You got to look at the stress that they go through. So they drive from Slovakia to Amsterdam, and they fly from Amsterdam to Chicago or Atlanta, wherever I bring them in. Then they drive to my place. Then I get them out of the crate, and we we spend the next several days recovering the dog. It's super super stressful. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, luckily not very often, they break psychologically. They break. You'll never see that dog. A department will never see that dog. I have to, I have to eat that. Um, I have to either send them back, but that's super expensive. Mm -hmm. I worked that out with my guy in Slovakia. Okay. But I will never give a department a dog that's broken or untrainable. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like to fail. <laughs> and if the new handler fails, I failed. And that's just not going to happen. That's not, that's not optional. Okay. Thank so. you. Um, can, can my understanding from your statements is you are 
only German Shepherds. Um, as this is a new program to North St. Paul, none of us, if we go with it, are sure, going to be sure what the right fit is. Um, can, can you just describe the benefits of German Shepherds versus some of the other um, types? Sure. The, the primary dogs that I use for dual-purpose patrol dogs, so a dual-purpose patrol dog is a patrol dog who does the tracking and the apprehension and the building searches, evidence searches, and he has a detection specialty, either narcotics or explosives. Most are narcotics. There aren't that many explosive dogs in the state. There just aren't. Uh, and your department would not need an explosive dog. Um, so for those dogs, we get German Shepherd and German Shepherd Malinois Cross, which is what Tony's dog is. Uh, the only other dog that, that you see are your single-purpose dogs, which are your sporting breeds. So your labs, your German short hair pointers, that type of thing. Um, the downside to a single-purpose dog is that you lose the ability to use that dog as a deterrent to flee, as a, as a, a, um, uh, as a tool to do building searches, area searches, and, you know, like Tony gave the example, stop or I'll send the dog, and the guy gave up as soon as he heard the dog bark. You do that with a lab, they're, they're going to laugh. Uh, so a lab doesn't offer you that opportunity. Um, I never bring back a dog that is not as social as Rick's dog. Never. I don't want that. I don't need the chief calling me saying, your dog bit my handler again, or he bit somebody he shouldn't have. That shouldn't be the dog's fault. That should be because the handler did something he shouldn't have done. People make mistakes. But my dogs are, are social, and they have to be. I don't want my name on, you know, just bite, bite, bite. That's just not what it's about. We spend a lot of time training just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, uh, de-escalation techniques. Why didn't you use a different level of force rather than the dog? We train that constantly. We do scenario-based training towards the end of the class where we put the handlers into situations where they have a decision to make. You got two seconds. What are you going to do? Well, the answer isn't I don't know because the police have to make split-second decisions on rapidly evolving situations. So we put them through those scenarios and, and make sure that they're making the correct decisions and that the handlers aren't getting hurt or killed. You get hurt and killed in training. We don't want you getting hurt and killed in the real world, and that's why we have training. So social, is, uh, social dogs are super, super important, not only for you, but for me and, it's, and the chief. <laughs> it's not adding another officer at night, one officer. If you have three now, one would be canine, and the other two would just be regular street patrol, correct? Yeah, it's not adding a, a person. It's just assigning uh, officers to become canine handlers, not an additional staffing increase. Okay. If this works out, um, could you describe to us um, because we don't have a canine program, what the process is. I'm assuming we have to develop a um, uh, rules when you can use him, public um, input to, to a canine program. Can you tell us that process? Sure, so we've been, that's kind of been a, a part of our uh, past two years of researching canine programs and uh, we have all the, the surrounding agencies who have canine programs, all of their policies, we've We've looked at all of them. Um, we, we are near completion of our own policy, um, which is, is in alignment with every other canine program within Ramsey County. We're not doing you know policies that allow us to do things that other agencies say that you can't do. So feel pretty good about our progress and our own policy right now. As far as the selection process, which uh, I'm sure Steve and Tony and, and Rick and everybody that has a K-9 program would say that it's one of the most important parts of uh, having a K-9 program is selecting the right handler. Uh, I would absolutely lean on um, the current programs and, and Steve and Tony and, and any other handlers to be a part of the selection process to let them weigh in on um, our officers that are interested in becoming K-9 handlers and helping us make sure we're identifying the right ones. Um, who have the, the energy and the drive and the motivation and the um, determination to be a, a great canine handler for our community. Another question with um, 
training. They you train. You if you have two of them, then they would train together. Wouldn't there still be overtime because you guys are twelve hour shifts? Yeah, we could get a little uh, creative on their training schedule to make the overlap occur with their schedule on their set training days. So you know, if you if you have our six to six normally uh, for our day shift starting on their on their day fours, we we would uh, you know have them end. If it's if it's an eight hour portion of that shift where they're working the same eight hours, so they both be scheduled. That's their training day. So then it would just be training at regular time instead of overtime wages. When they're doing the when they're doing the training, is that going to leave you down people out in the street during that time then? Too? Um, not not any different than it would be just for uh, you know somebody on vacation days. We'd actually have more staffing on because then we'd have two canine handlers on when they're normally not scheduled over the same overlap. So we'd actually have more cops in the city on their on their training days where if there was a big incident, then they could put the pause on training and go help handling calls. So that's good. All right. Well, I think we're appreciate the, appreciate the information and uh, thank you so much for like did a whip by with the dog up front if you could on the way out because <laughs> I do want to see the dog. I, been, been hearing him chew, but I haven't uh, <laughs> seen the dog yet. <laughs> thank, thank you, guys you all for, for listening. Time. Thank, thank you guys for coming here. Thank Appreciate you for being it. here. Thank you. Yeah, thank Appreciate you all it. for Thanks all the information. Very, very Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh. Don't take the ball away. <laughs> <laughs> Just what I was thinking. I want the ball. Does he want it more than I do? <laughs> we got a body cam? It's a beautiful dog. For the dog? Uh, no body cams for the dog. All right. Well, the color of sunny. Big dog. Oh, what a pretty dog. And that's the same mix you were talking about? He's a shepherd. There's the shepherd. Yep. Okay. Yep. Your, um, your cross, um, you know, sometimes they got more shepherd than Malawas, sometimes they have more Malawas than shepherd, but they tend to have a little bit shorter hair. Okay. It's like a Malawas, not a Malawas. Is this one of the specialty, too? Narcotics and control. Narcotics and control. You know, he's certified in both. So it, think about it, it's a steep climb. Yeah. A dog that knows nothing else. Mm -hmm. And a handler knows, knows less. Mm -hmm. And in 12 weeks, they come out and they're certified in control and narcotics. It's, it's amazing. And then a year later, they click. Are you enjoying uh, your assignment? Can you stand next to him so I can sure. Officer, are you enjoying your assignment with the dog sure, so far? So. Is it at home? Well, is it doing well? I have three kids. He gets along with all my kids. That's awesome. Well, aren't all now. aren't all men a little skittish? Excuse me. <laughs> this isn't recorded. Thank you. Oh, that's right. I didn't turn my microphone on. That one. My wife's gonna listen to that. I'm in trouble. <laughs> I got an extra room for you. <laughs> yeah, there's a plenty of garage. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Very Thank you, much. gentlemen. Hello there. Oh yeah, in a heartbeat. Not... <laughs> well, thank you. Right, we're ready to go on. Hey, Darrell. Okay, yeah. thanks for the opportunity. Um, we've got two presentations that are gonna follow um, the police presentation. There is a piece of city-owned property at 17th Avenue and Delaware Street that we've owned for over a decade, I believe. And we've had some interest in it um, un, unasked over the past few months. And so we issued an RFP to evaluate um, each of those. And we received three um, responses, two of which will be presentations tonight. So the first will be um, Tracy Luther and Doug Andrus. Looks like it's just Tracy tonight. He's not here yet. Oh. Oh well, the other the other people are here. If we want to do do them first, see we're early. <laughs> You're early. Just a moment. Okay. Good. Yeah. Bring the dog back in. Yeah. Everybody's leaving. What Workshop done? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. 
звучит он. We should have commercial breaks, I think. Yeah, we're going to switch the order. So High Point will be our first presentation. Perfect. I think your your partner's behind you, maybe. Ter Tracy, is that him? Yeah. All right. They're going to let High Point go first. Good to see you. Hi. Oh, yeah. Do you want a dog? We're giving away dogs. I was mayor. I would say. So. I'm not comfortable. Yeah, there's just a lot of like cars. Oh my gosh. You're welcome. They need to be re. You so. be reimbursed for your snacks? Mm -mm. No. I do it for the love of my family. Good, you? We're doing fine, thank Good. you. Good, welcome. Hi, Hello. I'm Jim Boo with High Point Land. You got a, you're a little taller than the last one. There you go. <laughs> now we got you. I might need a little IT support. Well, that's better. All right. We were going to just start our little video. Do you know how to do that? Um, let's see. First lane, I think. I think we should just be able to. Uh, this plug didn't, I think, already. Listen, you drop yep. four letter acronyms. Uh, and then do we <laughs> have some sound here? Too? Oh, I like the I golf. We already voted. <laughs> voted you off. Should I leave? <laughs> if you can fit a golf course on that parcel, I'd be pretty impressed. Well, there we go.
Well, I'm not quite sure what I was pointing at, but that, that was uh, just basically to show you that we have done some developing, excuse me. And so that was 3M Starton Park, the Royal, which we turned into the Royal Club. We were the real estate component for that. So in, do you have more that you want to show here? Uh, there is a, a kind of a slide. We, it just, just, it keeps us on track is all. Okay. high point group so I'm um, we are the high high point real estate land group and that we did the Royal Club development we if you go to our website and I won't spend a lot of time on that the purpose of it was just to demonstrate that we um, we have been in the land development business for probably north of 30 years um, I actually teach the land development class for Kaplan um, this particular site and project is important to us because I'm from Monomedi, and um, I happen to marry a Shifsky, um, which are right over there. I, that was a little work. I played some hockey. I don't know which was harder, getting marrying the Shifsky or, or, or playing for Herbie Brooks. But <laughs> anyway, we got through both of those. And so, but we're active in the land development business. And so in this, and I'll try to make it brief, I think it's going to, uh, is a couple of, couple of just agenda points. Uh, one is we'd, we would enjoy doing the project in our backyard simply because we are from here. It's important for us, uh, you know, I grew up here. I actually owned a, uh, a business here way back in the 80s, so uh, Boo Boo's Bar, and you guys are probably all too young to remember that, but I, I was, you play hockey, you buy a bar, and then you run out of money, and then you go into real estate to try to make a living. That was what happened to me. Anyway, uh, so we've been in the real estate business for about 30 years. And um, so in that, we're uh, brokers and qualified, teach the land development class at Kaplan, and um, have probably done, I don't know how many thousands of units in five different states. It's not a big deal. It's just what we specialize in is community relationship, listening to what the community uh, needs. We come out of the residential real estate sales uh, uh, world, so we understand product types. Like in the, in the example you just saw, saw, we change the second and third phases based on, on, the, on what the market was showing us. So we're, we understand that. And I think if we had to provide a couple of references, we were just awarded the Tanner's Lake project from Oakdale in a situation similar to this. It's been there for a long time, so we're gonna be developing that. Um, if you called the city of Centerville, we did Bayview Villas, which is on the water there. And I think if you called the city, you'd find, um, you'd find that we had a good working relationship. You know, so, and, and then Lake Elmo, I'm not sure if any of the same people are there. That was, that was, that was a challenging project, but we were able to work with the city and the community and get through that. Um, so as far as our team, it's Kim, myself, and then we have a builder uh, that we like a lot and, and use. And then I think the other thing I would talk about is, is price. Um, we originally were here uh, following Paul Bergerman, who's a friend who drew a site uh, plan that had 12 units. I think we submitted one with 20 units. I mean, that's, that's a little bit, if we get by the initial kind of uh, interview phase, then I think we take the time to draw something. I, I, I've had, we've had better results listening to the community rather than trying to force something in there. But as far as the price, goes, it's going to really depend on the number of units. It, it, you know, both of our drawings were an attached product. Um, I think you have to be price sensitive in that neighborhood to have a product that one fits in. Um, there we go with the Shivsky companies. So um, 
the fourth generation, my nephew does most of our utility work and, and road and sewer and infrastructure work, and they're obviously right here in town too. Anything else? Um, so we've got the experience which we just talked about. Not quite sure how we're doing on time. I, you know, I'd rather be a good listener. I mean, are there any questions that anybody might have that we could address or answer? Um, so the plans we received here that in our packet show four unit clusters. Is that what yes, you're sir. looking at doing? Correct. Is that uh, one story or two? Uh, Basically. It would be a two. You know, I, I think the plan that we thought of, and, and here's the original plan that we had here. Um, this is a project that we're, we looked at in Centerville that we're doing. It's a three-story. It's a park, live, sleep. You know, you park, it's a slab on grade. You live on the, on the second level, and then you sleep on the third level. You know, fairly common plan. This is the plan that was under contract uh, with 12 units, which was twin homes. It was six twin homes, and I think that was three years ago. It was uh, under contract with a friend of ours, Paul Bergerman, and um, so I think the price would be a conversation that's driven by density. You know, we really have no agenda that it has to be this or it has to be that. It's gonna be more communication with the neighborhood, because I think you're gonna find that the neighborhood, you know, is gonna have an opinion. Um, so this was the 12 unit plan. We submitted a 20 unit plan. And, um, and I think that part of it's open. You know, if we get to the point through this where we're in communication, it, it's similar to what we just did in Oakdale. We had an interview process. We chose to work together, you know, as a, as a group. And then we sat down with John Stark, who was there, um, uh, does, uh, he is our city planner and just kind of walk through what was important to them. So we had three different components in that particular one. And I think the formatting would be the same. We don't, we don't have an, a specific agenda that has to be this or it has to be that because we've had better uh, success kind of listening to the community, listening to the, to the city, and then looking at the market to see really what the market is calling for here. So that, that's, that's a little open-ended for discussion, you know, beyond this meeting, you know, that's how we'd approach it. Um, this is the project in, in Centerville that we were looking at. Um, this is a drawing that I think is in your package. Fairly straightforward, but if, if we needed to talk about the density or we had resistance from the neighborhood about the density, we just kind of, Audible and make a field adjustment to a less to a, something that was a little more less dense. Well, I've lived around you know for, for many years, and sure. people all think it's you know been an empty lot forever. But it was a church, of course. There was something there, but everybody who's moved in has moved in next to a, a vacant lot, so they probably think it's you know just sitting there forever the way it's going to be. So we're going to have some, I'm sure, some discussions. Just trying to figure it out. We do have housing for both ends. We need yep. we need more family, of course. Then we have the older people in the near, in the areas that need one level. So right. both of those are interest are, are very interesting to me because we have a need for both. I think in, in our community. And, and and I would agree. And it's similar to what we did in, in Lake Elmo. You know what we found is that about. 70% wanted were for a one, wanted a one level living and then the others were more family oriented. This might be a reverse of that where you have a, you know a family affordability with the interest rates and we're kind of in a different market, you know, it has to be price sensitive, it has to be com, you know competitive, three bedrooms, two baths, how do how do you get that to work? Well, these days it's in an attached building. But um there's enough room where you, you might do some detach. We have a plan where we have two, um, two, uh, two uh, units in the middle, and then, and then there's a one level on each side, and, and we're open to talking about that also. And part of it, too, when I look at that area, there's really not tall, like you're talking like the M&I, probably the garage sure. floor, yeah. floor. Yeah. Everything over there is one-story ramblers. Correct. So, I mean, that area is pretty much all that. So you yep. have that high buildings in density right there. I, they have a little 
I think if we took this plan and, and we changed the two end units to one level, I, I think we'd be going in the right direction, you know, or in the direction where it didn't just stick out like, uh, like it maybe didn't belong there. But that's open for discussion. I mean, our, our goal tonight was just to yep. introduce ourselves, say hi, if we get to a meeting, be on the meeting. You know, that's, those are all things that we talk about all the time. Sounds good. The one uh, feature on this, on this plan here is the fact that if the, if the neighbors bought in there uh, thinking that it's going to be vacant, uh, you know, there is, there is a lot of vacant. We've got a filtration. Mm -hmm. uh, pond there uh, on the one that and then just an open spot so so there is uh, there is open space for those folks uh, on the on the east end of the project which is kind of nice so the, the the development is really on the west side yep. of the project so it does kind of keep it open for those uh, neighbors there and is that going to be a, a, a like a park or just a wetland or what is the on that drawing that we'd you, be wide open wide open uh, we're going to need some ponding, and then you'll need yep. some open space. And so once yeah. we get it engineered, you know, into what 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 the consensus would be, in doing an awful lot of this, I mean, a neighborhood meeting, and you know, we, we just you know, most neighborhoods when we did Centerville, uh, Babyville is in Centerville, no one even talked to the neighbors. So you know, I think the communication with the neighbors is really important. Um, and so if we listen to the neighbors, we we know where we're trying to go and we provide some choices and I, th I think that communication on the front is important but back to your question it'd be ponding in, an, in some open space okay. yeah. any other questions anybody no well, thanks for thank you very much for bringing the, let you. us look at good. it thank you good meeting you folks yeah you appreciate too it. and appreciate thank uh, you uh, Bill Billy. Last question. We we brought we brought a number of examples of things that we're currently doing. I don't know if they really have importance or not. You can go to our website and find them. But we you know our last four or five projects that are in this neighborhood or, or in this area, East Metro. So if you anybody would like to see that, uh, maybe the best thing is just go to our website and, and find it. Yeah, I did go to the website and oh, at some of your places. Perfect. Very nice. Well, we're lugging them around here. <laughs> it's the biggest folder we got. There you go. I, and I have Kim carrying it. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting to see how big Tracy's folder is when he brings it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm Doug Andrus, and you probably all know Tracy, Tracy Luther. Luther. Yeah. Thank you. He's got his Thanks name so. everywhere in town. So, uh, I, 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 I'll start off by saying we will not be building a golf course. <laughs> really? <laughs> He's a little tight. <laughs> Mini golf. Mini That's golf. There you go. That's where the money Dad. is. <laughs> Could you throw up the mother We're not that yeah. tech savvy. So you'll just uh, use the arrow okay. down when you're ready to move? All right. This plan here, we've been working with Brandy and Brian and trying to figure this site out, you know, how we can do it. The problem with this site is that you see where outlot B is, that long, narrow part. It's only 125 feet. I mean, you know, their picture looked really nice, but it, it's not to scale. That's not going to work. You can't fit them buildings in here. Right here, you have your sewer and water going all the way through here that you have to be so many feet away from. You cannot build a road on it. You cannot put the buildings on it. It's kind of an acre and a half of worthless property is what it all amounts to. We tried to put this road in and do these townhome, standalone townhomes. Two units on the end. This unit won't even work because of the sewer and water. It's too close, so that would have to be taken out. So then you would end up with nine units. Well, they're talking about the Brueggemann development. 
Bergman came in here and when he proposed that development, as he found out, is why he's probably backed out of the deal, I called my excavating company, hey, give me a price for this. He said, well, chance would have it, he bid it for Bergerman. He knew all about the property. They had soil tests done and there's bad soil. Four to eight feet along that whole property where the church was and where the parking lot was. So that all has to be exported out to put in the road and the houses. This plan alone here, plus the other plan, we tried another plan here. We tried to go this way too, to try and lose one that way and try and do the road a little different. By putting in the road and the sewer and water, you got about $750,000 worth of work, 720 to 750. Not counting engineering fees and drafting fees. So you divide that out by nine properties and it's just not feasible to do. So now you're thinking, well, maybe we could put in more properties, but the dimensions just aren't there to do it. You know, to put a road in and to try and get four buildings here and four buildings here, even two stories, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work out, you know, to make it feasible to do. So then we come along and we just thought, well, this is about the best thing for this property is if we just divide it into six lots, standard city lots, you don't need a PUD, you don't need anything, these are all made to setbacks, these are exactly as the lots that are there. Along with this, which is not shown, is we'd have to have a pond right here too probably, you know, for drainage or whatnot, and the rest of it would just have to be left, it would either be an association with for them lots for just their own use, give it to the city, whatever. I mean, or divide it out and give it to the neighbors. You know, it's, it's not good for anything. That's the problem, it's just too narrow, you know. So, and we would just build regular single family homes on them, custom built. Uh, I don't know what else we can add. Well, back a little brief history, Doug and I did the project on 7th and 6th Street very recently, which is almost yeah, the Seventh Street townhomes are working Street on them. They're homes. almost gone. You know, uh, we've got a history of working with the city. Very recently, and we both have strong ties to the city. Um, we can get it done, and, I, and this scenario with their city lots. I mean, as a as a council and a planning commission and all of that, uh, it, it, it meets all code. And might save you guys from some trouble. I mean, they're gonna, it's going to raise the tax base uh, considerably for what you have right now. Um, that space behind again, it's just, the sewer runs through it. it. It's just, I don't know, I'd love to have an idea what, what to do with it. It, it. I know the property is on either side of that, would not be happy as long built in their backyard. I mean, yeah, but it's not feasible. It just it, it, it won't work uh, for getting fire in there and all those sorts of things. Um, it's a great corner. It's a great part of North St. Paul that is underutilized now. And, um, we could get it done. And we're not asking the city for any money, I guess, for lack of a better term. We would do it, finance it ourselves. This project still, it's still that sewer and water and that's still a yeah. couple hundred thousand, yeah. two to three hundred thousand just to, without a road to do it. So that's where we're kind of coming up with our price. You divide it out, yeah. you know, six lots. And, I mean, if you could get more, it'd be great, but if you study it just for a little bit, you can see how that's almost impossible. And we did look at some of the earlier plans that had been made. And yeah. They didn't work and, of course, didn't meet the city's expectations. For and if you have Bergerman's plan, go ahead and take a look yeah. at them. On them plans, there are no dimensions. You scale that there at all. There's 50 pages, there's no dimensions. You scale it off from what I'm telling you from a tax statement, it don't work. Bergerman's plan don't work. And it fits. You know. His, his final plan was what, nine units? 12, I don't know. Or he went down nine. from 12 to nine? Mm. 12 to nine. Who did? Uh, Bergerman. Bergerman. Yeah, yeah, I think mm -hmm. he had quite a few and then they knocked it down. 
know, to pick up two more units with the road, that's the problem. It just doesn't pay to pick up two units. And of course, these would face 17th. We've already done some preliminary work with the county, with the county road. They mm -hmm. seem to have a problem with curb cuts or anything like that. Yeah, the county already approved them yeah. four driveways yeah. if we wanted. We explained the situation to them, and they said, yeah, no problem. These will be like your seventh avenue house, your seventh? It would be more like the sixth street. Sixth turn. Single family homes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, there would be, you know, split entries. I mean, we, we can custom build them to whatever, but more than likely be a split entry to try and keep the price down. Again, but they're still, you know, you can't build anything for less than 400000 it seems. Just to make sure I'm understanding it right, the panhandle, for lack of a better word, would be would be landlocked, though, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, well that's, no, between the, the there would have to be access, but no, no public access to it, unless the city we gave the land to the city, we could you know do something between here. You could put an easement through here for a high park. People are walking past yeah. get there. No, I just wanted to make sure in my mind yeah. I was thinking of things correctly. Yeah. We're open for discussion. It could be part of the association, what they would do with it. I don't know. It, it, the most value would be to the adjoining properties, I would think. I thought at one time you were discussing like a villa, like a one level. Um, that was the other ones, right? The ones? Right. Yeah. The other ones. The problem now, you try it like this, you know, what, we've done them before, but. You know, they face 17th, two are facing here. They're not really in a cluster like a townhouse type deal, you know, where they're all together. They're more like single family homes. So they're a little tougher to sell as a townhouse when they're kind of designed like that, you know? We so. have found with the townhouses, which are multi-level. I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's seniors that have sold their house in North mm -hmm. St. Paul that are moving into those, which is- right. Right. Very much possible with these these units also. Any questions? How many square feet? That's what I said. With the houses, were you looking at square foot size for these homes? Uh, they'd be around. Uh, well, I brought a couple that I showed you that we did on Sixth Street. They'd be similar to that. I, if, I don't know if this would. I can just hold it up here. I think would be best. But these are just two styles. This is a. You know, two different split entries that we get on 6th Street, you can drive by. Okay. Two going down the other end of the shop. Yeah, I mean, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, we can squeeze in, put in a three-car garage, standard house. Mm -hmm. You know, people like that get the four bedrooms, they can get two baths. And in that case on 6th, which was a little bit of a, I don't know, it really upgraded that street when you go down there now. I mean, the houses were a little older stock, and, and uh, it looks great there. Yeah. And these sold right away again. Yeah, right away, right in a week. Put them up to sell. I mean, it's, well, there's nothing new in North St. Paul. Yeah, North St. Paul is a great, uh, yeah. great place, and people want to be here. I mean, we'd love to put in more if you could, but I just don't see, it just isn't feasible to do. That's the problem, you know. It seems like when you get, it's two and a half acres, you put that in your head, two and a half, that's a lot of property, but it's just, you know, if you had another 50 feet or so along this one, it would help like hell, you know, but it, you don't. You're telling me, Tracy, there is room for mini golf, is what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Playing green, whatever you want to put in there. So, so we challenge you. Yeah. So a park. A park. Cool. Here a park. Yeah. But that, you know, the parks department may want to get creative with it. We you can see the portion we would need, the ponding would go on that east side and rest of it can be split off and can be retained by the city of North St. Paul if they'd like. I'm turned around, east side being left or right on that? Right. The handle. The handle. Okay. Hammer yeah. North. Thank you. Any other questions, anybody? Mm -hmm. Just spitballing, if any of the houses on 17th mm -hmm. ever open. That helped develop 
anything else back there in I guess what we've now called the corner? <laughs> well, you can. Um, you I mean, is there? You're, you're, it's landlocked on every side, isn't it? Because houses mm-hmm. to the east too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The seventeenth lots are very deep. I don't yeah. remember how much they are. The back street lots aren't as deep, but yeah. there's one to the side. I mean, you've got a great square if you take out those four or five houses. But yeah. it, it uh, again, housing in North St. Paul is, seems to be very hot. And yes, there is uh, there is higher interest and so on, but it hasn't seemed to change the market that much <laughs> from our perspective. But yeah, you'd get a great square out of there, but. Estimating what your six residential lots, uh, six residential houses would be uh, cost prohibitive now. Sure. Mm-hmm. Any idea what your around your final price for the homes would be? They'd probably be around four fifty or so, you know, depending on. Okay. Like I said, it's tough to build anything for less than four now, even you know. Mm-hmm. So split entry being one of the less expensive to do, easier to finish the. Bottom bedrooms and the bathrooms. Get more bang for your buck. Yeah, for four bedrooms, two baths, maybe three baths, you know. Compared to like a Rambler or something where it gets pretty expensive you know, to do that. What we found is when these people sell their house and they're custom built, they it escalates as they ask for four season porches and other things. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the ones up them townhomes, you know, we started at 400. The average on them are, I would say, between five and 550. They're finishing the basements. I mean, all out, it's kind of unbelievable, really. I didn't think that many people would finish their basements, you know, because just two people, a couple usually buying them, and, but they finish them too, so. And these are basically being the more custom built and stacked. You're not just going to, you're going to have them sold before you break ground? That's the plan. Okay. That'd be the plan, or else we'll just throw one out we'll build to start it, you know. Okay. As we did with the townhouses, so I built the yeah. first twin, and then... You still got something to see, you know. May I ask if there's any interest in exploring a little bit more density, like perhaps a PUD to make smaller lots? Well, again, we with those other plans... I mean, these lots, you know, these are city lots already, which are small. I think they're 60 feet, 60 or 65. So it, you have a five-foot setback on each side. So like the houses I showed you, they're just exactly right on. If we do go less, it's it's not like you can do it enough to, to make it work. You know what I mean? You can't shrink enough. Sorry, you don't. Yeah. Like even like these, you couldn't shrink enough to get another lot, even here on these four. Because you couldn't build the house. you, you got to keep the house a certain size or it's going to be too small for the cost. <clears throat> See what I'm saying? It costs, you know, your heating costs are the same. Your electrical costs are basically the same in a house. You all got a furnace, air conditioner. So you got a 1,000 square foot house or you got a 15, it's basically the same. So you're... You kind of, it's, it's, they're tougher to sell. You get them too small. If the lot's too small and we got to build the house too small, it, it, it gets a pretty tough to sell them. Yeah, I guess my concern there is if we're talking about our elders and if it's too big, then that's a lot to clean or work and maintain. So if, if that is the population we're thinking about, that's where my concern would be. This would be for anybody. This would be most. First time home buyers, middle home buyers, you know, anything as a custom build. This this isn't, you know, for seniors by no means, unless you're going to build a Rambler or something like that, a one story. We found that that's what retains these folks in North St. Paul, at least from the townhouse project, is that they, they, those townhouses are big. They haven't really downsized, Jim. But, yeah. but as far as the lot goes, yes, I mean, you go two stories multiple three stories um, I don't think the neighbors are going to like to do that hmm. this really does delineate the neighborhood I think yeah. Yeah. again it's that panhandle there that <laughs> just screws everything up you know you, got, you should get royalties every time they say panhandle yeah. <laughs> <laughs> new name for I it. move to adopt that no, motion no, no. <laughs> alright not like you're yeah, thinking no, we're in workshop oh. doggone it 
You almost you missed it by that much. All right. Any other questions, anybody? I think I'm good. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate Thank you. your time, guys. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks. thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm for the police dog. <laughs> <laughs> you going to house one? Yeah. I assume he'll be raising some money from them. <laughs> Mm. Thank you. All right. Let me get back to. Any other business? No other business? Okay. That's called to. Oh, are we going to have a little bit more discussion? To give direction? Do we give direction here well, tonight? I wasn't was? sure. That was, that was the intent if there was time. I wasn't sure. Do we how much about the numbers and everything? Okay, I wasn't sure either. Oh. Twenty after? Are we good to do a little bit? Ten minutes. Sure. If you want to start, I mean, otherwise we we go to another night. Do we have enough? I mean, my my question is, help me understand what the out, what you're looking yeah. for an outcome. Are you lo you're not looking for us to pick someone right now, or are you? Well, ultimately. Yes, that is the direction that staff is seeking. It doesn't have to be tonight necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, we could place it on a council agenda for the August meeting. Didn't know if you would need any more time or any further questions that we could look into or not, but yeah, it's, it's up to you for if you want to go with the decision. This is new for me, but I mean, the contrast and, and, and do we get into the details that you know he said there's too many as far as the land and even size i mean i this is new to me as far as how we get down to that i think it's difficult to navigate the um, capacity that the land can hold without having the detailed engineering studies prepared so i think at this point we're just taking their expertise um, at land development into consideration and also what the our zoning and comprehensive plan say so it's currently zoned for single family but our comp plan does recommend medium density uh, residential. Yeah, I guess that's where like I lean more towards the high point is because it it aligns with our comp plan and um, we can have a little bit more density. I think that is important and that is our goal um, in a lot of ways. And so, um, yeah, I, I really see a value in that. And I like a park. They were very, you know, open to seeing that space in a different way, and I really appreciated that. Anybody else? I like the park idea, and I think we could get, honestly, both of them to go for it, though. My own is kind of the, the neighborhood, you know, don't want to be too massive in that little area as far as what they're used to is the, the height of the homes and things like that. So that concerns me a little bit when you have that many in that height. Because mm -hmm. I look at the M&I down there, I'm, maybe I'm saying that wrong, M, is it M&I? Mm -hmm. You know, those things are just towers. And just, a, I wasn't in this position last time uh, Brueggemann had brought this forward. There was quite a bit of feedback from the public around that area of concerns about uh, high density. Um, that was brought up a few times. I didn't know the full background behind it, but I just know that was one of the issues. I mean, are there steps and processes that we need to go through? Do we need to have a community, another community meeting to talk about the development, or, do, or can we move forward without doing that? Um, do we need to talk the nuts and the bolts of the dollars, the expectations of the developers, as far as whether power lines need to be buried and who's going to cover the costs. Uh, I, I got more questions than I have directions at this point in time. So, I, I think it would be helpful to have in the interim between now and the next meeting to maybe send your questions to staff so that we can provide a, a thorough report for you to consider at the next meeting. There's a discrepancy, credit discrepancy between prices too. Correct. Yes. To pay. And is, is High Point asking, because they said they're not asking for anything, is High Point asking for any kind of help or anything like that? I think not to my knowledge. That. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think we need to have a little time here and I like that idea, get the questions and be able to understand, like we can't get anything done in 10 minutes, but at least we got a good presentations and we have, if we can get it on again, we'll go from there for August. If that works. That that does. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
All right, call for adjournment. So moved. So moved. Second. Member Cole, Council Member Wong. All those in favor say aye. 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 Water break. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't last. <laughs>